Well, this is Pentecost Sunday. And I have to say this right from the beginning. Pentecost was in the part of God. It was part of his divine plan. Just as much as the cross, the resurrection, his his, uh, ascending into heaven was part of what he had got on his heart for this world, Pentecost was another step, another part of what his greater plan was, and still is. Because God has not run out of ideas. This world might have run out of ideas, but our God has not run out of ideas. And that's why greater things are yet to come. We are waiting for the coming of Jesus and all that he's going to do. But there's some stuff to be done before then. And um, right in the book of Joel, which is obviously a key verse on Pentecost Sunday, Joel 2, just tw- uh, 28 to 32, I'll read down. Joel, the Old Testament prophet, even before all of this has happened, before the church has even been thought of, before Jesus has ever been born, prophesies these words. Afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all peoples. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, and blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank God we're living in that time. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord says, even among the survivors who the Lord calls. But then Joel prophesies it, and then John the Baptist comes, doesn't he, to make a way for Jesus to come. And he has some words to say as he bursts onto the scene. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then Jesus himself, just before he goes and ascends into heaven, makes a promise to his people, to his disciples. On one occasion, while, they were eating, while he was eating with them, he gave them this commandment, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the Father, which is promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Right in the heart of God's plan, right from the beginning. And then we just, just look at it really, the church's birthday. What happened there as the church was born? Well, there was some phenomenal stuff happened. The wind rushed, mush, rushing righty wind. Tongues of fire came. The miracle of supernatural communication. People who were getting preached to, these people were speaking in tongues and they were hearing it in their own language. That's amazing, isn't it? That God should go to a multicultural bunch of people and the speaking in tongues minister to those that they could never have ministered to in their own natural language. And you know what? Those disciples were transformed, weren't they? From a bunch of whimpering, I mean, poor old Peter had cussed Jesus out and did not, uh, cussed Jesus and, and the little girl and denied him and, and, and done all everything that you're not supposed to do. And then now he's get, so full with the Holy Spirit, he's like a different man. And there's the outpouring of the blessing and then people supernaturally encountering God And people are being convicted of their sin. They know they need to be made clean. And they're becoming followers of the way. They weren't called Christians then. They would call themselves the way. They followed the way. So my big question this morning, if it was on the heart of God to so fill his church with his power and his presence, why right now are we so insipid and weak? For as much as the noise we are making this morning, we need more of God. We know that we do. That's why we're praying for 24 hours come Saturday. And there's a few thoughts that came to me at my desk early this week that have caused me to ponder and think. And I hope they stir your heart as we look at this together. The first thing I want you to think about this morning is the early church had nothing but God. Somebody once said to me, you'll never know how much, all, how much of God you need until God is all that you have. I think some of us have hit rock bottom and found out that he's all that we needed. But that is true. But the early church had nothing but God. They had nothing to rely on. Just, just, just think about that first meeting in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit came and they fell out of there and they looked like drunk men. Just think about it for a moment. Just imagine if we got a Hillsong's Church planting coordinator here and we say to him, what do we need to do to start a church? He'd tell us that we needed a PA. They didn't have any of them. Well, that we needed some chairs because nobody's going to want to stand up for long. 
that we need to put some podcasts on after so people could listen who didn't come. We need to start the meeting at a definite time and finish it at a definite time. Well, there's definitely none of that. That we need a building, perhaps, to meet in. That we definitely need some follow-up literature with the church stuff on. Didn't have any of that either, did they? That we'd have to call people into membership. It's a miracle the early church worked, really, when you think about it. But all God's got, that's all we need. You know what, we just we need his presence, don't we? We need his power. So what, you can have all your tick list. When God shows up, 3,000 people get saved in a day. That's what we want. All they had was the gospel that Jesus had taught them. That's all they had. All, they didn't have much else. I'm sure they had some understanding of the Old Testament, as many of the Jewish lads did and were brought up. But actually, they'd spent three and a half years with Jesus and they'd seen him heal the sick and raise the dead. And he told them to wait for the touch of the Holy Spirit. And all they did was carry on the mission that God had commissioned them to do. God had, was all that they had. And I want to suggest to you this morning, sometimes we have made other things a greater priority than having the presence of God. Uh, we need his presence in our church. Because the rest of it is semantics. It is, honestly. We've seen more people saved this last couple of weeks, outside of church and inside of church. Because it's not about having a church building, it's about being the church, isn't it? Into our community and where we are. Which is amazing. The second thing I want you to think about this morning is not only was God all that they had, is that the early church hadn't invented any rules to control things. Church leaders and denominations have created a whole set of rules that Jesus never intended. You know, the scripture says that Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to, to, to do away with it. He fulfilled it in its entirety. And when I'm, I'm not talking about doing away with morality here. Of course, there are moral standards from God's word that we uphold and we hold to be true and we trust in. I'm not talking about that. But let me just give you a few thoughts here that really struck me very deeply over the week. Membership to the early church was not about carrying a card. It was about carrying a cross wasn't it? I belong to the Baptist Union. I belong to the Methodist Church. Good on you. I'm putting a cross on my back and I'm doing what Jesus asked me to do, which is go follow him daily. What's the most important? I've, I've been listening to, um, some of you have, have, may have heard some of the Arthur Blessed stuff, the guy who pulled a cross off the wall uh, in his nightclub and has walked some 44,000 miles on foot and leading countless people to Christ. And it has just captivated my imagination again this week. The cross is all that we need. Take up the cross and follow him. You don't need the cards, you just need the cross. They didn't have time enough to print cards in the early church, did they? They wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to keep up with it. Oh, well, we need a membership role. Good luck with that then. When 3,000 people got saved one day and then 5,000 people another day, and you don't even know where they came from. And some of them came from other countries. Makes you think, doesn't it? They didn't have four years to put people through Bible college. Gifts were released by the Holy Spirit. And they got licensed by the Holy Ghost to preach, not by the Baptist Union or the Assemblies of God Conference. Strange, isn't it, you know? I think William Booth would have agreed with these early Christians. You know what William Booth said? He said, uh, most Christians would like to send their recruits to Bible college for at least five years. I'd just like to send them to hell for five minutes. They would do more than anything else to prepare them for a lifetime of compassionate ministry. These boys were in hell. The, the, the Roman authorities were on their backs. Uh, the fight was on. I said to, to Flutie, you know, giving his testimony on next Sunday night, this is the biggest fight you're going to ever have because you're now fighting for souls, not for money. And we need to just bear these things in mind. You know, this is the early church. Didn't have time. Well, yeah, well, so-and-so looks like he's, he's a good lad. We'll, we'll send him off to college. Maybe he can preach in three years' time when he's ready. They didn't have time for that. But the Holy Spirit can do in people in a moment what we could take a lifetime to try and squeeze into people. You know, people come out of college more confused, some of them, than they went in there. And I'm not decrying education. We believe in education. But the more educated the church has become, I tell you what, the less powerful it's become. The seminaries are filled with people who've got a lot up in their head but not a lot in their heart. 
We need some passionate preachers again. I'm not saying that we shouldn't know the truth. Of course we should. There's room for both, but we need passionate preachers. In the early church, baptism was not a thing that required a course and six months to see if you'd been good enough to be a member. It happened immediately as a confession of your salvation. Somehow we want to almost control people, don't we? Say, well, you know, if you're good enough for about three months, then we'll baptise you. That's, that's not the teaching of the Bible. It, it, it's part of that picking up the cross and following Jesus. So hopefully in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to open this tank because we've got a couple of people who want to be baptised that only got saved a couple of weeks ago. Isn't that good? So am I worried that everything's right in people's lives? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I can't control you. I can't go home and, and look into your heart. Only God can do that. Communion didn't require membership. It declared in itself and of itself, I belong. They met with each other daily, breaking bread, because they wanted to be with each other, because they, by doing that, declared, we are part of this. And that's why I'm not overly fund on card carrying membership of any church. If you will come on a Sunday morning and break bread with us, for me, that's enough to say, look, we're part of this, and we want to be part of this family. You know what? They understood God lived in them and not in a building. They didn't ever spire an altar. They did not go to church. They were the church. They didn't have an altar to call a prayer line in, but they saw more miracles on street corners and in homes and in the temple court than we've seen in our lifetime. Amazing. I've just been talking about you. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I'm, let, let's pray. God, as Andy stands to share his testimony next week, I, I'm praying that the supernatural strength will come. For everything that he's trained for in the past, we believe you've trained him for today, for the winning of souls. Lord Jesus, we, we are, we are, this is not a sideshow that we're putting on, but we want men and women, boys and girls, men in particular, to come to faith in Jesus. And Lord, I, I just pray you strengthen him. I just pray that you put your anointing upon him. And that this week, Lord Jesus, that you'll be around and about him. And as he just talks about the wonderful things that you have done, that, Lord Jesus, you'll change men, men's hearts and women's hearts in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll teach you to come late, won't you? <laughs> 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 I ain't fighting him. Yeah. Right, it is one. You're not going to like this one. If you're not like some of the other ones, you're not going to like this one. They, believed, they didn't believe in tithing. They believed in 100% giving. Well, that's up to everybody, so we'll move on. It's absolutely true. They did not believe in tithing. They, they believed in giving everything because time was short. And, and this, is, this third point now, for me, really does sum up. The early church did not have time to mess around. Due to the urgency that was brought about by the persecution and, an, and complete passionate belief that Jesus would return at any time, they knew they had to get on with it. Again, get the ill song. I'm not knocking ill songs, by the way. But get the ill songs church plan to here. You tell me I need a five-year plan. These boys didn't have a five-day plan, did they? They could not contain what God was doing. It's all right us planning what we want to do, and then asking God if He'll bless it. We need to find out what God wants to do, and it will be blessed already. We need the plan of heaven, not the plan of earth. And so, they were just they were just for it. They were on it. You know what? They feared the Lord more than they feared the authorities of the day. And they'd rather honour God than they please man. These are big, bold statements, but it's true of the early church. Every moment was taken for God. Prisons became prayer and praise rooms, didn't they? Oh, we haven't got a nice building to meet in. Well, in the middle of a stinking, rotten jail, these boys were praising God and worshipping and praying. And you know what? The, the place shook and God showed up and angels turned up. Well, you've got to have a building, didn't you? What, what, what are you going to do without a building? Courtrooms became pulpits. As they were under trial and duress, these people stood there and said, we're followers of Jesus. And you can beat us and you can beat us again because we're going to come back to this place because we're followers of Jesus. We believe that he's the Son of God. 
Persecution was a sign of success. Riot evangelism was legitimate. I love that. I've read a lot of books, but I've never read anybody that said you could have a riot. They caused a riot, these boys. When they started messing with the occult and kicking out the people that were messing with demons and all that trade, there was a riot in the city, wasn't there? And many people came to faith. Riot evangelism was in the Bible. That's more like your sort of evangelism, isn't it? <laughs> riot evangelism. Never heard of it in my life. It's in the Bible. These boys shook the place. So committed to the cause. The law of God counted more than the law of the land. That's a big one. Church leaders prayed and preached. They didn't do endless counselling, attend endless meetings, and attend their ministers' prayer breakfasts, otherwise known as gossip centres. Believe what you want, I've been to them. So. I've been once. Here you go. Sin was not swept under the carpet. It was always dealt with. That's a huge one. There are churches that have closed down right across our nation and across this world because of sin that has not been dealt with. We need to run to God for judgment, not run from him. And things need to be put right in the house of God. Judgment, the scripture says, begins at the house of God. They were totally, their lives were totally committed to the Great Commission and world evangelization. And the fourth one, I will confess, I got off the internet. Okay, But it was good, because I was looking for some ideas. I wasn't looking for a sermon, I was looking for some ideas. But I came across a church historian, um, Rodney Stark, who, who wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. And he says this, Church historians, apart from noting the fact of the passionate evangelism driven by the spirit-filled life, noticed three major things about the early church. And he says this, it became the greatest movement on the planet that has ever been seen. First was this, the early church took care of the sick and the poor. They, they estimate that 95% of all the money that was taken in the early church was spent on the sick and the poor, not on themselves. Now there's a huge challenge in itself, isn't it? Is, you all the women can shout amen in a minute. The early church honoured women and endowed them with dignity that they'd never had before. There's no room for sexism in the church or ageism or anything else. We're those that love what God has created and we need men and women of God to serve together. The early church movement, the third point was, multi-ethnical, a local church movement. Wherever the gospel was, it was countercultural, so it, it didn't matter even on Mars Hill, arrayed with all of those idols, the gospel counted in every single area, whether people worshipped thousands of idols or one idol or a statue or a dog or a horse or whatever they decided they were going to bow down and worship the gospel was relevant and it changed and transformed communities inside out and back to front that's why I continue to pray that we'll be a multi-ethical, multinational community here, I believe there's people in other countries that are still yet to come to be part of this house of prayer and we believe it. These are the things that turn the world upside down. So having said all of that, where does that leave us this morning? I suggest it leaves us on our knees, asking God to reprioritize our lives and our church so that we might be filled with the Holy Spirit and have a fresh revelation of what church is all about, that we might, again, be world changers. And that's my message this morning. It's a simple one, isn't it? Somehow, we have lost God's best. Whether it's been because... You know, a lot of us have been bought, well, a lot of us have been saved in, through denominational structures that are only a couple of hundred years old. There's lots of bells and whistles being added that really the Bible never added. I, I just want to get back to what, what it's all about, the core of the gospel, you know, the, the real deal where you preach about Jesus and his cross and his blood and people, you know, give their lives to the Lord. It's not about putting up their hand. It's about saying, I'll take that cross. I want to be baptized. Let me follow Jesus. People who really get born again, you know, have a hunger for the Bible. People get really born again and have got a, a conviction of their sin. Some of that other stuff is just persuading people to join the Christian lifestyle. That's not being saved, is it? I, and I fear that somehow, over our generation, there's been a whole lot of that. Churches filled with people who have got Christianity but really didn't get Christ. You know. So I want us to pray. And we're going to sing a song and we're going to come around the communion table.
And I'm going to ask, ask, say, God, would you fill us afresh? Will you fill us afresh? We've got 24 hours uh, come Saturday to pray God would pour out your spirit. But I'd like to do that now. And even before we get to Saturday, that God would revisit our church. Let's stand. Would you stand with me? I know I've knocked a few sacred cows this morning. I'm not trying to throw the baby out with a bathwater, but realistically, friends, there are thousands of people out there that need Jesus, and we, and we need we need to be so filled with His Spirit and His presence and His Word that our lives are making a significant difference. Not that we're just opening these doors on a Sunday and coming having a good time and going away again. And that, that's not New Testament Christianity. It's, it's, it's far from New Testament Christianity. Father, this morning, Lord, I just pray over our fellowship here, and not just for us, but for every church that stands in this area to preach the gospel, and opens the Bible and prays and honours your name and honours your word. Lord, would you send your fire today? Would you fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit? Would you bring us into a place of just that heart open towards you again? Lord, forgive us for the times when our minds have been so closed that it's caused our hearts to be closed as well, that we've, we've written off things spiritually because our minds have been so closed up with rules and regulations made by men and not made by God. And so, Lord, I'm asking you this morning to wipe our minds clean, renew our minds, we pray, and fill us again with your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name.